Vanakkam Namaskar you are watching our show Rastram and I am your host Sanjay Madrasi Pandey Did you know India is celebrating the 400th birth anniversary of legendary warrior Lachit Barpuka Now you might want to ask Lachit who and that's precisely where the story starts Our history books are replete with invasions that show the Hindu kings and dynasties suffering crushing and humiliating defeats at the hands of foreign invaders be it the radical Islamic zealots from Turkey, Persia, Middle East or Afghanistan or shrewd Christian colonizers from Europe. But the left liberal and closet jihadi cabal of historians that wrote our post independence history books not only deliberately undermined the Hindu resistance but also took special care to reduce indic heroes like lachit barpukan to mere footnotes or completely wipe them out of the history books ideally warriors like rajendra chola from south prithviraj chauhan from north bajirao peshwa from west and lachit barpukan from northeast should have been the who's who of indian history but they were reduced to a mere who i'm sure most of you wouldn't have heard about the names of three out of the four national heroes i just mentioned So why is the story of Lachit Barpukan not a part of our school syllabus? Why has this piece of history been kept outside the mainstream academics? Why Ahom chief ministers of Assam, Hiteshwar Saikia and Tarun Gogoi did nothing to tell the story of Saraigarh? The first efforts of mainstreaming Lachit's legacy was witnessed during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government. When the BJP led NDA named the best cadet medal in National Defence Academy after Lachit Maybe because this tale of greatest indic valor does not fit into the narrative of the left islamist cabal dominating indian academia since independence the subplots of the sarai ghat tale are even more problematic for these thugs so what the cabal did not want you to know why the battle of sarai ghat still relevant in modern india in 1671 lachit barpukan the commander in chief of the ahoms defeated the mighty mughal army on the banks of brahmaputra shattering 500 year old islamic dream of colonizing northeast and thereby the entire southeast asia through land route although the ahoms had fewer resources and manpower the mughals's difficulty with the terrain gave the ahoms an advantage the mughals reached the western border of the ahom kingdom by 1671 where the ahom army was waiting for them Lachit Barpukan realized that it was impossible to defeat the cavalry and mounted forces of the Mughals on land. The Ahoms were expert naval fighters and they knew the Mughals were weak on the naval front. Lachit Barpukan decided to block the Mughals at Sarai Ghat where the river was merely 1 km wide. He made a strategic retreat to Guwahati forcing the Mughals into the water. The Ahoms built a series of mud walls around Guwahati in a way that the embankments joined with the existing hills in the region to create a barricade. The task of constructing one such strategically important wall was assigned to his maternal uncle. When Lachit came to inspect the progress of the work the night before the war, he was shocked to see the workers sleeping under the stars. Turned out that his uncle had allowed the workers to rest for some time as they were tired. Lachit became so furious at his uncle's lax behavior that he drew his sword and beheaded him in one stroke, saying, "Dekhot koi momai dangor na hoy." that loosely translates into my uncle is not greater than my motherland the workers had got the message and the wall was ready by the morning it was because of these mud walls lachit forced the mughal army to move to the river unfortunately lachit barpukan had become seriously ill and he could not join the war this demoralized the ahom soldiers and the mughals started to gain ground As the Mughals inched closer to victory, an ailing Lachit Barpukan jumped into a warship and started to lead the army. He heroically commanded the soldiers and what followed was a fierce battle between the Ahoms and the Mughals. With the Mughal army advancing and Lachit's health deteriorating further, the Ahom army's spirit started waning. Making things worse, the Mughals had started to advance on the land too. Driven by call of duty towards his motherland and his people, Lachit entered the battlefield lying on the bed on the final day of the Sarai Ghat fight. To boost the morale of his soldiers, Barpukan asked his men to transport his bed to the battlefield on a boat. Lachit's bold and daring move at the face of adversity motivated Ahom army that launched a massive attack on the invaders and started to chase them away. 
As the news of Mughal Admiral Munawar Khan's killing spread in the rank and file, their leaderless naval force couldn't maintain the attack and ultimately decided to retreat. The Ahoms chased them for around 170 km up to Manas River, which became the boundary between the Ahom and the Koch Kingdom, a vessel of the Mughal Empire. The Mughals had invested heavily in this war and built a massive army equipped with best of resources available at that time. But Lachit Barpukan used a brilliant combination of guerrilla tactics, subterfuge, diplomacy, daring, and psychological warfare and military illusion to attack the Mughal army. Here's a classic example of a military illusion that changed the course of Sarai Ghat battle. In the middle of the war, hundreds of banana leaves with lunch leftovers started floating downstream past the Mughal war boats on the mighty, expansive Brahmaputra, prompting Mughal commander Munawar Khan to tell his troops to relax. The enemy construed that Ahoms might have just finished their meal and must be resting. Little did they realize that it was Lachit Barpukan's art of military illusion at play. The Ahom commander had made his men send those plantain leaves floating to lull his enemy into complacency and inaction. The stage was set for the warrior legend's decisive assault. Ahom troops swooped down in land and river amphibious attack with the traditional one-edged hangdang swords, bows, arrows, javelins, guns, matchlocks, and cannons. Fallen prey to Lachit's masterful military illusion, a complacent Munawar Khan was busy smoking hookah in the middle of a raging and decisive war. His complacency cost him his life and handed the Mughals a crushing and humiliating defeat. The 1671 battle, under the leadership of Lachit Barpukan, delivered Mughals a tremendous psychological blow, destroying the illusion of their invincibility. If the Mughals had won the key battle of Saraighat in 1671 and vanquished Barpukan, they would have massacred the Ahoms, including non-combatants, raped and enslaved the women as sex slaves while forcing all surviving men and children to convert to Islam. Needless to say, this is how the Mughals and the other invading Muslim armies around the world treated the vanquished. History is replete with examples of such savagery performed by Muslim soldiers on the Kafirs they conquered. The Ahoms and Lachit Barfukan have contributed significantly to India's northeastern region. Lachit Barfukan's endeavors ensured that the holy territory of Kamakya did not fall to the ruthless Mughals. The Mughal Ahom Wars that started in 1615 during Jahangir's reign and culminated in 1671 during Aurangzeb's tenure had been going on for six decades during which the Ahoms defeated the Mughals 17 times. Since the first attack on the Ahoms ended in a humiliating defeat for Abu Bakr and Raja Satrajit of Bhushna, the leaders of the Mughal forces decided to take a more calculated approach towards the Ahoms. Till 1639, many battles would be fought between the two sides and territories would keep changing hands. Eventually, both sides agreed to sign a treaty after the Mughals had advanced into Assam and captured Kamrup. As per the Treaty of Asurar Ali, signed in February 1639, Western Assam commencing from Guwahati went to the Mughals. The Ahoms finally acknowledged the Mughal control of Kamrup and the Mughals acknowledge the rule of the Ahoms. But the clashes and skirmishes between the two sides continued despite the treaty, taking advantage of confusion in the Mughal dynasty plagued by brewing succession wars, Ahom King Jayadhwaj Singha drove the Mughals out in 1648. Aurangzeb, who imprisoned his own father, Emperor Shah Jahan, killed his brothers Dara Siko and Shah Suja in the war of succession, did not take this humiliation at the hands of Ahoms very kindly. As soon as he took the throne, the Islamic Zealot immediately ordered Mir Zumla to annex Assam again. Mir Zumla marched on Assam in early 1662 and on 17th March 1662 entered the city of Gargao, the capital of the Ahom Empire. Raja Jaidhwaj had to flee and take shelter in the hills. Soon monsoons came as some sort of divine intervention for the Ahoms. Unable to cope with the flood fury and unforgiving rains, the Mughal army started to lose morale. Soon soldiers started falling sick and mass. Even Aurangzeb's commander Mir Jumla fell ill in December 1662. The Ahom king was keen for peace and gaining control of his kingdom and the Mughal troops were unwilling to continue there. 
This led to a treaty in January 1663 in which the control of Western Assam was given to the Mughals and a war of indemnity of rupees 3 lakh and 90 elephants was promised. If this was not enough, the king was made to give up his only child and daughter Ramani and his niece for the emperor's harem. His six-year-old daughter was converted and named Rahmat Banu Begum and sent to the Mughal harem. In 1663, Raja Chakradhwaja Singh took over. He had not forgotten the humiliation. He decided to stop paying the fine and swore to drive the Islamic invaders out of Assam. In August 1667, Ahom army started its decisive march. Within a short span of two months, they drove out the Mughals and captured Mughal Fauzdar Sayyid Firoz Khan and reclaimed their lost glory and prestige. When Aurangzeb heard about this humiliating defeat at the hands of Ahoms, he sent a large army under Raja Ram Singh of Ambar, son of Raja Jai Singh, accompanied by Rashid Khan, ex fauzdar of Guwahati, only to get a final bout of humiliation in the greatest naval battle ever fought on river at the hands of Lachit Parpukhan in 1671. The Mughals' repeated defeat at the hands of Ahoms, the gatekeepers of Northeast, shattered Islamic zealot Aurangzeb's dream to conquer Southeast Asia. As per many old and contemporary historians, if it was not for Lachit, expansion of the Mughal Empire into Northeast India and even further into Southeast Asia was a sure possibility. Lachit Barpukan, who changed the course of history with his tactical acumen and personal bravery, is surely one of the greatest heroes of India. So why does the Battle of Sarai Ghat make anti-India forces so squeamish? Because Sarai Ghat stands as the icon of this civilization's battle against Islamic invaders' dream of demographic and cultural takeover. What the Islamic invaders couldn't do in 500 years, the British and Muslim League Nexus did it in around 100 years after the annexation of Assam in 1826. The sinister plan of altering the demography of Hindu-majority Assam started in 1906 when Hordes of people were brought in from East Bengal, now Bangladesh, and made to settle down in the lands of Ahoms. It was an alliance of convenience. The British needed cheap labor, and the Muslim League wanted to bring about demographic changes in the predominantly non-Muslim Assam and other Northeastern states. The strategy that was made at a conference in Dhaka in 1906 had started to show its results already. In the census of 1931, large-scale migration from East Bengal to Assam was noted. The then Congress stalwarts like Gopinath Bordoloi raised a red flag, but a naive Jawahar Lal Nehru brushed that under the carpet and made this irresponsible statement. Nature abhors vacuum, meaning where there is open space, how can one prevent people from settling there? Beer Savarkar responded to this with his masterly prediction. Nature also abhors poisonous gas. The migration of such large number of Muslims in Assam threatened not just the local culture, but also proved to be a national security problem for India on its northeast frontiers. Rampant illegal migration from Bangladesh that started in 1906 went on smoothly even after partition of India and then partition of West Pakistan, altering Assam's demography forever. Demography change has pushed Assam into turmoil repeatedly since the partition. From the Nelly massacre under Indira Gandhi to recent terror activities like Pakistan training Rohingya terrorists trying to push them into India from Assam, Jamatut Mujahideen terrorists planning jihad against India and more. While the Assam Accord was signed to preserve the identity of Assam, the influx of illegal refugees has been a massive problem for Assam and India at large. From 24% in 1951, Muslim population has gone up to 35% in 2011. And when the next census is done, it could be pushing 40%. A substantial portion of Muslim population of Assam is on the target of radical Islamic outfits for recruitment. Today, not only the Assamese language and culture, but also our internal security is at grave perils. Something that the likes of Lachit Barpukan and Ahoms jealously guarded for around 600 years. Lachit's story was reduced to a mere footnote in history books because of its Hindu overtones. Having smelled an opportunity here, BJP's open embracing 
and mainstreaming of the Ahom's heroics has unearthed those who built their entire career on minority. Infamous for their convenient cherry-picking and peddling their half-truths as knowledge, the left liberal cabal has tried to argue that Lachit Barpukan and the Ahoms were not Hindus. The full truth is that Thai Ahom community came from Hunan province in South China in the distant past. They settled in Assam and became Vaishnavite Hindus. Till date, all Ahoms celebrate the first day of Rongali Bihu as Guru Bihu, where they bathe, clean a cow and give her special food and worship her. The Shiva, Vishnu and Devi Dols, meaning temples built by Ahom kings and queens in Assam's Sivsagar district, stand testimony to their Hindu roots. The attempt to de-Hinduize Ahoms in Northeast or Cholas in the South is apparently a part of a sinister Hindu phobic agenda that furthers the narrative if there is something great, it can't be Hindu. Today, India needs uncompromising nationalism to fight the unholy alliance of strange bedfellows, radical Islam and radical left, enjoying tacit support of the proponent of the missionary position. In a resurgent India, the stories of the likes of Lachit Barpukan and their uncompromising nationalism must be taught to every child, something we as children were devoid of. Mm -hmm.